And of, co of course, it's just the latest of a number of books that you've been involved with. And what we really want to focus on in terms of this discussion is one of your other books, which for, for purposes of those who are watching this rather than just listening to it, so I'll hold this up now, which is uh, Take Care, How to Be a Great Employer for Working Carers. And the roots of this book comes from your own experience, doesn't it? And obviously we did the sort of the potted life history in the first one, but we didn't really touch in detail about the aspect that this covers. So first of all, I know central figure to all of this is, is your mum. Tell me a little bit first before we sort of go into the, the detail of the book, what kind of a character she was and, and what role she had in, in your upbringing. So you're quite right. The book is dedicated to, to her memory. I, I started writing it before she died and I, I told her that I was working on, on this new book and it was going to be dedicated to her. So she was rather chuffed about that. Uh, I think she was a bit worried that she had to buy a few copies of it. But, um, <laughs> and, and after sadly she, she died at the, at the ripe old age of, 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 of 93 when I felt able to, to go back to, to doing things and started a, again on the book, I decided, well, it would still be dedicated to her memory. And it was dedicated to her memory because she, and you know, most of us are in the fortunate position of, of, of having wonderful, loving parents. And, 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 and that was certainly my experience. Um, she was a primary school teacher um, all her working life and uh, by all accounts, uh, uh, a, a, a very good one. Um, and certainly, I know, you know, from my own you know, upbringing that, that she was a very, very capable teacher. And when she died, one of the comments from so many old family friends and, 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 and family members was how right to the end she remained really interested in what they were about. And she wasn't phased by the, 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 the sort of the great, nephews and great nieces with their iPads and what have you and was <laughs> fascinated about being able to do a, a FaceTime call and, 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 and what have you. And this is going to be the mark of a great teacher, isn't it? That sort of mentality of being genuinely interested yes. in the people in front of you. Absolutely. And you know, so at the, at the start of every academic year in, in September, she would come home and be talking about, you know, sort because of, obviously in the first few days, trying to remember all of the, the class of, of 30 or um, in her earlier years, of course, you know, she had classes of 40 and 50 plus in Sheffield after World War II. And so um, sort of having to remember very quickly all the kids' names. And, you know, this is before you have sort of the ability to be able to take photographs on iPhone and, you know, match the names on, 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 on charts and, and yes. things to keep rehearsing them whilst you're, 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 you're learning their names and so on. So she was a very strong figure. And she was particularly influential for me because, and I did, when, when we spoke last time, I did touch on this, that, when I was 11, actually on my 11th birthday, I was rushed into the Sheffield Children's Hospital and the surgeons only gave me a few hours to live because yeah. somehow I contracted a very, very nasty bone disease um, and it was touch and go for quite a long time after that and I was in a what they call a, a, a hip spiker which was plaster of Paris from right up here down to big toes with strategic holes and... Um, <laughs> which, um, apart from anything else, used to get incredibly itchy, I cannot tell you. And my mum, bless her, one of the many things that she had to do for me, you know, because basically everything had to be done for me for nearly a year, was getting a long knitting needle out and really so gently, just terribly carefully, getting some of the, 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 the dead skin, you know, under the, the uh, 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 at the edges of, the, uh, of, of this big hip spiker. So, she looked after me and, of course, precisely the moment when most of us expect to become much more independent of our parents, you know, 11, 12, yes. I suddenly went through a really challenging experience where my parents had to do everything for me in terms of, you know, the, the, the equivalent of the potty and everything else. So... I had a huge respect for my mum because she gave up teaching for a year. It was very tough financially for, for my parents because they, they suddenly lost you know, sort of half the, um, the income. Um, yeah. and, uh, and it was very tough, obviously, also, because you know, my mum was a, a full-time 
care. I mean, we didn't use that kind of language. No, you know, no, she no. was just being my mum. Yes. And so years and years later, when first my dad and then my mum started to need some extra help, then, of course, you know, I tried to do what I thought was you know, my inadequate best to try and, and help. And I didn't think of myself either as caring yes. um, for my mum and dad or being their carer. Um, I just thought, you know, this is what a family member uh, who loves another family member does, you know, just looking after them. Which I assume is the, the standard transition that nobody starts from day one thinking, I've just become a carer. It's just something that something changes, something changes, something changes, and then suddenly you look back and you think, oh, goodness. Yes, and today in the UK, well over 6,000 people will start their caring journey. Over 2.1 million Britons each year will become a carer. 6,000 each day. So between now and 2025, for example, 15 million or more Britons will become carers. Obviously, many people will cease their caring journey, either because the person they're looking after gets better and doesn't yes. need so much um, or any help anymore, or sadly, obviously, because you know, a lot of the people who are being looked after um, will die. Yes. So this is a huge issue. I mean, one of the, the quotes that I, I found and, and use in Take Care is a wonderful quotation from Rosalind Carter, who was, of course, the American first lady. Um, her husband, Jimmy Carter, was, was president in the 70s. And she says there are only four kinds of people in life. There are those who are carers. There are those who will be carers. There are those who have been carers, and there are those who will need caring for. Mm -hmm. And of course, many of us will fit into all of those categories. I have, during the course already, um, of my life. And so this is part of what it is to be human. It's not somehow something which is separate you know, from yes. most of our lives. And I have the, the, the enormous privilege of, of chairing um, the the charity Carers UK, which has been going now for 54 years. And we're working for a, a society which is carer friendly, which respects and supports and values carers. David, it's, I find it absolutely typical of you that having had personal exposure to an issue, you then become active in discovering more about it and finding out what you can do to make a wider difference on it and as you mentioned earlier you've ended up as chairman for carers uk what have been the things you've discovered about the issue since you took that role that you found most surprising so first of all it is actually getting many more employers to understand just what a big issue this is in their workforce so I was in, 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 in Israel just a, 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 a few weeks ago and was, was, was talking with wonderful social entrepreneur Rachel Ladani there who runs Caregivers Israel. And they are one of the organisations um, like Carers UK around the world. And they're one of the organisations like Carers UK, which has decided that part of their agenda will be to try to support employers. And... Um, Rachel was telling me about a meeting that she'd just done with one of, of, of her early members where the kind of the clincher had been when the, 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 the senior management team of this business had just sort of gone around the room and said, anyone here actually caring for a, a family member or a close friend or what have you? And well over half the, the, right. the, the, the management team put, put their hands up. So for me... The, the first thing is how do we get many more employers to see that this is a mainstream, critical kind of business issue in terms of, of um, workforce resilience and, and, and making sure that you don't lose a lot of talent. Today, by, 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 by the end of today, 600 people in Britain will have given up their job because they no longer felt that they were able to juggle working and caring for a loved one. Most of those people don't want to do that. Yes. So what we're trying to do in Employers for Carers, what um, I was trying to 
to express in, in Take Care is if employers can get smarter at developing a carer strategy, if they can do some very often quite straightforward steps, which don't need to cost anything or very much, then we could stop many of those involuntary um, quitters from having to leave their, their work because leaving their job to become a full-time carer for some may become a, an absolute necessity because the person that, that, that they um, love and are looking after um, just needs so, so much attention and there are not other ways of being able to, to provide it. But it's bad for people if they have to give up work in, in voluntarily. First of all, huge immediate financial impact, um, but also, of course, long-term impact on fam family finances because very quickly people start to draw down savings and things, and of yeah. course, there's less of a pension yeah. pot later on. Um, so if we can make workplaces more resilient yes. for people juggling work and care, that's a win for the individual employees, but it's crucially also a win for the employer because the peak age for people being involved with, 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 with caring for a loved one is 45 to 64. And of course, that's many of the most talented, experienced people in the workplace. Yes. And I must say, it's very easy to underestimate the negative impact that some of the people have to endure in, their, in that situation. Some of the facts that you put in the book, some of the statistics there, I mean, particularly struck me. Uh, for example, you said that uh, 8 in 10 carers felt lonely or socially isolated as a result of their caring responsibilities. 57% of carers lost touch with friends and family as a result of caring. Half of carers say they've experienced difficulties in their relationship with their partner. 38% of carers in full-time employment have felt isolated from the other people at work because of how different they feel of the, the problems that they're facing. I mean, those are some remarkable statistics about isolation and, and people struggling with a, a situation that they you know, may have found themselves in that they didn't used to endure. From your own experience then, what can carers in that situation do to limit the negative impact on their own health and well-being? I mean, we'll talk about employers and what they yep. do. Yep. But if you're in that situation, you know, it starts with you what do you do when, when you become aware that this is chipping away at all of your resilience and, and, and your health and your self-resolve and all of it? And, and um, it, 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 it is um, a real challenge because if you've got a choice between, so I do, do I take the person I'm looking after to their GP appointment or for that hospital visit, or do I get my own checkup and what have you, then... <laughs> It's not yours that, that gets the priority. So yeah. um, there are some really um, big, big, big challenges around looking after yourself, which is why a lot of the, the resources on the Carers UK website are around how to look after yourself um, as well as looking after the person that, that you are, are, are caring for. So just developing some survival and, and coping mechanisms, whether that's um, having a... Um, another family member or a neighbour or a friend who can pop in um, even for an hour or two hours once a week so you can go and get your hair done for example obviously some of us don't have to worry about that but um, <laughs> just having something that can give you a break is is really important going for a walk I mean uh, one of our good close friends and, and, and long-term colleagues in business in the community Mel Melody McLaren um, who's who's been very um, upfront about the fact you know, that she's she's looking after her her, her husband, um, and you know, Mel um, makes a point of, of of getting a bit of time out you know, to go to the gym, and in fact is about to run the London Marathon, um, uh, uh, fantastically. Um, so having something that, that that you that you can look forward to is is really uh, important. Um, we're in Carers UK trying to encourage more people to to think about what very simple practical steps they can do to either 
take up a, a new sport or to resume a sport that they used to love and, 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 and enjoy um, to try and keep um, uh, physically uh, as fit uh, as, 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 as possible. Yes. And I guess the reason why people don't do this is they think that it's selfish to think about such things when the other person needs help. But it's like, I suppose, when you fly and they always say, you know, exactly. when the oxygen masks come down, exactly. put your own on before helping someone else. Because, yes. of course, in that situation, you can pass out very quickly and you can't help anyone if yes. that happens. In the same way, if you're not keeping yourself together, both in terms of your physical and your mental state, then your ability to be helpful to the other person is going to go down accordingly. Absolutely brilliant analogy, and it's one that we, 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 we do make, um, and encouraging people to feel that you know, it's, it's okay, which is why we have a community forum, for example, on, on, um, uh, on the Cares UK website, why we have uh, a Facebook page where people can, can vent a bit, you know, very often about you know, just what they're feeling and, 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 yeah. and so on. And, and having that sense of, of there are some people out there who understand what I'm going through and who can relate to, to just where I'm feeling at the moment, which is why um, happily we have quite a number of people who have come to the end of their caring journey who volunteer with Carers UK just to be a bit of a, a, a listening ear um, to to people who, who just need someone to, to talk to. Yes. And we're part of an ageing society, we, we know that, and we know that therefore the number of people who are going to end up becoming carers is expected to go up and has been showing signs of going up. I know you quoted in the book that there were 6.5 million carers in the UK. I know that was based on the census figures from... 2011, yes. 2011, so... So it's probably already up way above seven, seven and a half, half million. We know, um, even from the, the 2011 data, that, that there's going to be at least two million more carers at any one time by, 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 by the 2030s and we think probably that's going to be much, much earlier than, than, than that. Well, just taking the bigger picture question on that, what does that mean for us as a society? Because we used to live in extended families and I guess that that structure is perfectly adapted for, for those sorts of situations. We no longer live in extended families. Uh, we have this very dynamic isolationist, uh, in many ways, now structure within society. Do we think that the state just picks up the tab for all of this? And what does that look like? I mean, even in Scandinavia, they're struggling with some of the questions around that. How, how does this play out over the next 10, 20 years? So this is one of many of the, the burning injustices, the, the big societal issues that have been put on the back burner because of, of, of our ongoing uh, debates around, uh, uh, around the European Union. So we get very frustrated in Carers UK because we were promised, or the UK was promised, um, that there would be a, a green paper, not even a white paper, a green paper on future funding of adult social care. In, and for non-UK summer, people, a green paper is an exploratory is, is a much paper. more exploratory, here are a number of possible options. And then a white paper is more visa. What we this think is it's this is the plan, and there. we'll be bringing in you know legislation yeah. to to implement this and so on. So we were promised a green paper that would be out summer twenty seventeen, um, and now with 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 various election perda rules and so on, it's going to be at least uh, summer twenty nineteen, and, and 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 maybe sadly even longer. But let me just put the context that. We have data produced by Professor Sue Yendel of the University of Sheffield, who's a, a leading global researcher on, on, on social care that we work very closely with. And Sue looked back in 2015 at if you had to pay on a very conservative set of assumptions for all of the unpaid caregiving by family and friends, what would that cost the UK? And her figure back in 2015 was £132 billion pounds a year, almost a second National Health Service budget. Now, Demos, 
uh, a few months ago, did an update using exactly the same Sue Yendel methodology, and they said now that figure is already $138 billion using our Carers UK methodology. So, yes, we do need to have a proper settlement in terms of what the state is going to be able to pay for in terms of paid social work. But the National Audit Office has, has, has shown us very clearly that the, the state-funded social care, social care work, is dwarfed by already what families are paying for privately and is even more dwarfed by the contribution of unpaid carers. So any kind of viable long-term settlement yeah. must have the contribution of family and friends voluntarily caring for their loved ones right at the heart of, of, of thinking. And that's why now as part of the new 10-year National Health Service plan for England, there is so much emphasis on supporting carers, not least in terms of supporting the health of, 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 of unpaid uh, carers, because the National Health Service understands that that's critical yes. to being able to deliver on, 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 on the rest of our aspirations for our National Health Service.